Hi guys. Today we're going to be talking about absolute dating. Not the kind of dating you might think I'm talking about, but the dating of rocks. The only kind of dating I do. Absolute dating. This picture in this title slide kind of summarizes the entire concept of absolute or radioactive dating. It shows here a newly formed rock with all its parent isotopes or red dots in this case, uranium. And then later on, the rock gets older, the uranium or parent isotope decays and more of the stable daughter isotope, in this case lead, starts to form in blue dots. The older uh, the rock gets, the more blue dots or daughter product or lead in this case you get. And so we can take the ratio of parent to daughter isotope in a rock and tell the age of it because we know that this radioactive decay happens at a constant rate that thankfully previous scientists have figured out for us. So geochronology is the study of Earth's age and the methods in which we determine these ages. So we can either determine the relative age or the absolute age of rocks on Earth. And we do relative dating by the methods that I talked about in the last video. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's called Geo logic time and relative dating. This video though, we're focusing on absolute dating, which is a more quantitative method as you can see here in this Venn diagram. Another difference is that relative dating, as it is aptly named, is only dating rocks relative to each other. Basically, you walk up to an outcrop, there's some strata or rock layers, and you say, well, that one's underneath this other one, so it's older. And so it's not as quantitative, it's more qualitative, and it's not as precise. But they both do provide an age, which is one of the similarities, and they provide orders of formation of the rock layers. But how we obtain absolute ages has to do a lot with isotopes, so you're going to need to understand a little bit about atomic nuclei and isotopes. Each element has a unique atomic number. This atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. The number of protons is what defines an element. If you change the number of protons, it is no longer that element. It's now a different element. However, if you change the number of electrons or neutrons, it's the same element, but a different ion or isotope respectively. The change in electrons causes ions, but we're not going to be talking about those today. We're talking about isotopes. There's not always the same number of neutrons as there is protons. And this is what causes isotopes to happen. Here's an example of hydrogen, which typically has one proton and one electron. And this is just shown in the nucleus. The electrons are not shown in this image. But if you add a neutron, it is now deuterium. And if you add two neutrons, it's now tritarium. And so deuterium and tritarium are isotopes of hydrogen. But in this video, we're not going to be talking about all isotopes. We're only going to be talking about those that decay. And that's because this dating method is based on radioactive decay processes. This radioactive decay occurs when an isotope is unstable and wants to become stable, meaning its nucleus isn't happy with so many neutrons and protons, and it wants to get rid of some or change some or add some. And so it's decaying into different isotopes. And the original nucleus before decay is called the parent nucleus or the parent isotope. And the product of this decay process is called the daughter nucleus or daughter isotope. But not all isotopes are radioactive or unstable. There are isotopes that are stable. And so I thought I'd introduce this with carbon because we will be talking about the radioactive decay of carbon-14. However, carbon's other two isotopes, 12 and 13, are stable and they do not decay. And so we can't use them for dating, but they are important. And because of this, we're going to be talking about stable isotopes in a whole separate episode or episodes because the stable isotopes of carbon as well as stable isotopes for other light atoms like oxygen are really important for geologic reconstruction. And that's why these deserve their own separate episodes. So remember that stable isotopes isotopes do exist, not all isotopes are radioactive. However, for carbon, there is a radioactive isotope, and that is carbon-14, which we will get to in later slides, but it does decay, and it decays into something that's totally not carbon at all, so we'll get into how that happens. I'm going to be talking about three main processes of radioactive decay, alpha decay, beta decay, and beta capture. Alpha decay can be shown by the example of uranium-238, which decays into lead-206. Alpha decay happens by loss of an alpha particle, which is just two protons and two neutrons, or as we like to call it, helium, just because anything with two protons by definition is helium. But basically you can see here in the equations that that doesn't necessarily add up. Because if you've ever seen 
protein isotope notation, you know that this top number is the number of protons plus neutrons, and the bottom number is number of protons only. And so if you're losing two protons and two neutrons, how is it going all the way down to 82 and 206? What the heck? Okay, guys, I get it. This one's a weird one. The rest are going to be easier. The reason that these numbers go down so much for uranium decay is because uranium T38 decays over a long process. The first product of uranium decay is thorium. And then there's, I want to say like 16 other products before you actually get to the stable product, which is lead. The reason that these things happen in long chains like this is because sometimes when decay occurs, the dotted product is also radioactive. So it will decay as well. And decay will happen again and again and again and again until you get to a final stable product. And this is what lead is for this decay chain of uranium-238. The next thing we'll be talking about is beta decay. Beta decay is the loss of a beta particle, which is just a negatively charged particle emitted from a neutron turning it into a proton. Yeah, I didn't know that they could do that either until I started learning about absolute dating. So if you're out there and you're wondering, holy crap, neutrons can just do that? Well, yeah, they can. So this happens in decay processes such as carbon-14 decay. Carbon-14, which we saw was the radioactive isotope of carbon, decays into nitrogen-14. As you can see, the proton and neutron number didn't change, which makes sense because you're not losing or gaining any protons or neutrons. It's just that one neutron is turning into a proton. So the proton number goes up, changing the element of the isotope, which is now nitrogen, but not changing the neutron proton number. The last decay process we're going to discuss is beta capture. So this is basically the opposite of beta decay. Instead of giving away a negatively charged particle, the nucleus is actually going to capture a negatively charged particle, turning a proton into a neutron. Because the proton is positively charged, if it gets some negative charge, it'll become neutral. In terms of potassium-40, it decays into argon-40, which as you can see has a lower number of protons, but the same number of protons and neutrons. So it's just the opposite of what we saw happen in the beta decay. Basically, the proton number went down, but a proton turned into a neutron, so a new neutron number went up, and therefore the protons plus neutrons stay the same. Just to recap these three processes, we're going to discuss them with some depiction. In this slide, you can see that alpha decay is depicted by this figure showing uranium-238 decaying into, like I said, the first product of its decay process is thorium. So it's decaying into thorium by losing a helium or an alpha particle, like we talked about, two protons and two neutrons. So therefore, 238 becomes 234 because four particles from the nucleus are leaving, and then 92 becomes 90 because only two of those four particles are protons. In this slide, you can see beta decay is depicted here in this figure as carbon-14 turns into nitrogen-14 by loss of a beta particle turning one of the neutrons into a proton, which is why the proton number goes up, but the neutron plus proton number stays the same. And in this slide, you can see beta capture in this depiction as potassium-40 captures one of its inner shell electrons, turning one of its protons into a neutron, causing the proton number to go down, but the neutron plus proton number to stay the same, which causes the formation of argon-40. Okay, so half-lives. What are these half-lives? What does that mean? And how does that help us determine the age of the rocks? How does any of this help us determine the age of the rocks? Well, here we go. A half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half of the parent isotopes to decay into the daughter isotopes. And the parent isotopes are radioactive and the daughter isotopes are termed radiogenic. So you can see in this little diagram, you have a rock that's just been formed with 100% of its parent isotopes and 0% of daughter isotopes. Whereas once it has decayed after one half-life, you will have 50% parent isotope and 50% daughter isotope. If you keep doing this, you will keep dividing the amount of parent isotopes in half while the daughter isotopes will continue to accumulate. For example, we saw that the decay of carbon-14 happens by beta decay, but that doesn't matter here. Basically, all you need to know is that the parent isotope is carbon-14, and that if you start with 100% of it, and then one half-life goes by, you will get 50% of it. And if another half-life goes by, you will get 25% of it. And if another half-life goes by, you will get 12.5% of it. And if another one goes by, you will get 6.25% of it. 
and so on. This seems pretty simple, right? So how would you determine the age by this? Say you come up to a fossil and you're like, what is your age, man? And then you look at the amount of carbon-14 in it and you find that only 6.25% of the original carbon-14 is remaining. Then you know that four half-lives have gone by and you know the half-life of carbon is 5,730 years because smart scientists have figured that out for us. You can multiply four by 5,730 years and you will get the age of that fossil. But those of you with your brain screwed on today are probably thinking, how do you know that the amount of carbon-14 in there is only 6.25 of the original? How do you know the original amount? Well, you can tell with the daughter isotope. You take the ratio of parent to daughter isotope and you'll be able to tell not only how much parent is remaining, but also how much parent has decayed. Okay, so what can we use this on? Can we use this on all rocks? Not quite. So basically carbon-14 you need to have organic material for. Pretty much all the other methods you will need to have igneous rocks to be the most accurate, which is unfortunate, but you can also date metamorphic rocks if you're aiming for the last metamorphic event. Sedimentary rocks, however, are not as easy to date because their grains are just aggregates of previous grains from previous rocks, so you would get a different age from basically every single grain. There are some methods to determine the age of sedimentary rocks, such as something called optically stimulated luminescence, which I might describe in a future episode. Also, you can date sedimentary rock layers if you have enough fossils in them to relatively date them pretty accurately, or if you have layers of igneous material like volcanic ash layers and sedimentary strata are often used to date formations of sedimentary rocks in a more precise way than maybe relative dating can get you. But all you need to understand here basically is the methods we described here worked best for igneous rocks. The way that you would apply radiometric dating is you would measure the amount of parent isotope in a mass spectrometer, you would measure the amount of daughter isotope in a mass spectrometer, and then you would determine the number of half-lives that have gone by by this parent-daughter ratio, and then you would determine the age by multiplying the number of half-lives that have gone by by the half-life duration that you know because you can look it up. Now lastly, all I want to do here is do a couple of examples with you. If you want to do some hands-on practice, you can pause before I tell you the answer and try it yourself. First, a fossil bone is measured to contain 3.125% of its original C14 parent isotope. What is the age of the bone? The C14 half-life is written down for your reference, so go ahead and pause the video and try it yourself. Now I'm going to tell you how I got the answer. Basically the first step that I did was determine how many half-lives went by by starting with 100% of carbon-14 dividing by two until I got 3.125. I got 3.125 after five times of dividing by two, which means that five half-lives went by. And since I know how many half-lives went by, all I gotta do is multiply five by 5,730. This gets me 28,650 years of age. The second exercise asks, an isotope has a half-life of six hours. How much will be left after 24 hours? So to do this, first I determined how many half-lives would go by after 24 hours. Basically, how many times can you put six hours into 24 hours? And that is four. So I'm in a table of four half-lives with two rows. First row is time, second row is percentage remaining. And this is the most clear and easy way to do this problem. So at time zero, zero time has gone by and 100% of the parent isotope is remaining. After the first half-life, six hours have gone by and 50% of the parent isotope is remaining. After half-life two, 12 hours have gone by and 25% is remaining. After the third half-life, 18 hours have gone by and 12.5% is remaining. And after the fourth half-life, you are at your end of your 24 hours and 6.25% of your parent isotope is remaining. So I hope this practice helped, and I hope this video helped, and I hope you guys enjoyed learning about absolute dating as much as I enjoy anything that has to do with isotopes. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.